All right, so we've learned that the atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, very small. The electrons are really far away. We've learned that we can find out the masses of atoms by adding up and figuring out an average atomic mass, abundance times mass, abundance plus abundance times mass, divided by the total abundance. And we use that average atomic mass so we don't have to count each individual atom. It works really well. The next thing we're going to talk about is the electrons, right? So here we go. We have a question. Where are the electrons? And they are very far away, right? They are floating really, 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 really far out from the nucleus, right? Again, the analogy, if I make myself into a nucleus, my first electron's at the moon, and there's nothing in between, halfway to the moon, and there's nothing in between. So what are they responsible for? And it turns out they are responsible for all of chemistry. You want to know what something's going to do, you have to know what its electrons are doing. Now, why is that? Why would these things be responsible for all of chemistry? Well, if you think about it, here, I'm an atom, right? And I, I have only a little bit of space, so even though I'm a nucleus here, I only can make my electrons this far. But let's say I'm coming up, and I'm coming up, and I've got these electrons, and they're sitting out here floating around my nucleus, wee, 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 right? And they're out here. Now, what happens when another atom comes up to me from the other side? What are they gonna see first? Are they gonna see my electrons first? Or are they gonna see my nucleus first? They're gonna see my electrons first, right? Because you come up, these electrons are floating really far away. The nucleus is buried inside. It's this little tiny thing. So you're gonna see my electrons first. So when one atom comes up to another atom, what do they see? Is they see each other's electrons. And so that's why knowing what happens to the electrons is critically important. Because if you know what happens to the electrons, you know how these atoms are going to interact with each other. Because that's what they interact with. The nucleus is buried, the electrons are really far out there, and they're the thing that you see first. Okay, so what was the charge on an electron? If you remember, the charge on an electron was negative. And do they attract or repel one another? Well, just like the same side of a magnet, north and north, south and south, they are going to repel each other. And it's going to be really important later on to realize that electrons don't really want to be near each other. They will if they have to, but they don't really want to. They're going to repel each other and try to get away from each other. So what we want to do is figure out where do these electrons live, right? We've seen these little drawings like this. We've got the nucleus here, and you just draw the electron in a big ring around here. And is that actually what happens? Are the electrons just floating around in a ring, or do they do other things? Well, it turns out it's actually relatively complicated. We're going to simplify it a little bit. They don't live anywhere they want. They can't just kind of float around and be wherever they want to be. They can only exist in very specific places in the atom. It's kind of like a bookshelf. So it's, it, it, a bookshelf is a decent analogy. You look down here, and let's say we're on the first bookshelf. We take a book out, we put a book back in. We can only put it on that shelf, right? If we tried to hover that book just a little above that first shelf and we let go, the book would fall down to the bookshelf, to the actual shelf, because it can't exist in between two shelves. A book can only exist on a particular bookshelf. Well, it turns out electrons are pretty similar. They're like the books. They can only exist on individual shelves. They can't exist in between those shelves. But we have a funny bookshelf. I'm going to redraw it slightly. We have a funny bookshelf that on the first shelf, two electrons can exist. On the second shelf, it's a little bit bigger, and up to eight electrons can exist. And as we keep going up and we get more shelves on our bookshelf, more and more electrons can exist in them. And so <clears throat> we have to figure out not only where are all those electrons, but how many of them are in each shelf? How do we know how many are in each shelf? Do, do I have to memorize that there's two in this one, eight in this one, ten? Or, no. Turns out we're going to find out that it's pretty easy to figure all this stuff out um, if you follow the periodic table. One thing you'll notice on this diagram here is they're talking about increasing energy. Why is there increasing energy? Well, because down here they're saying, hey, the nucleus. Now, what's in the nucleus? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. So there's these little balls down here in the nucleus that are positively charged. And our electrons up here are negatively charged, right? All those little guys are negatively charged. Now, just like opposite poles of a magnet, these guys attract each other. The negative electron is attracted to the positive proton. And well, you're like, well, if they're attracted, why don't they just come up and hit each other? And it just turns out they can't. We won't deal with the details of that, but they can't. 
They can only exist in this level. They can't go down to the nucleus even though they want to. Okay? So they're attracted to each other. So as I go further and further away, I'm less happy, right? If this negative electron, wouldn't he rather be closer to this positive charge down here? He would. And so as you move him further and further away, he's unhappier and unhappier. And in general, that results in increasing energy. So those electrons at the higher, higher levels, higher bookshelves, they're increasing energy. You can think about it too as a bookshelf, right? If you want to put something on a really high bookshelf, you got to use a little more energy to do that. So that's what we're talking about here. So what we're going to talk about next is how do we know how they arrange? If we look again at our periodic table, we can talk about them. So let's pick uh, hydrogen. It's got one electron. Which shelf does it exist on? Well, we go over maybe to chlorine. Remember, it's one of the halogens, one of the kind of light purple ones, number 17. Where is that going to be? How many? Where are 17 electrons going to go, and how do I know where 17 electrons are going to go? It seems like a lot to keep track of. But it turns out electrons behave very, very well and very, very predictably, uh, at least in this circumstance. And so we can predict them. Now, one of the things your text does is it has this little table here and says, you know, one way to know about electron arrangement for the first 20 elements is to memorize this table. And I look at this table and that is not a table that I want to memorize. Do you want to memorize it? You are welcome to. I, I'm not offended if you memorize this table, but there's a lot of information on there and it's not something I really want to do. And it turns out you don't need to because it turns out that the periodic table tells you everything you need to know about how the electrons are going to arrange themselves. Okay, so I'm going to tr keep, try to keep this periodic table on here and also draw below it. So I'm going to draw our nucleus again, right? It's got positive charges in it. It's also got these neutrons in it, which are negatively charged. Okay, now what we're going to do is start drawing our electrons. Now, electrons exist in these little bookshelves. I'm drawing it sideways. So <clears throat> if we start with the first, first bookshelf, then we got our second bookshelf, and we got our third bookshelf, and we got our fourth bookshelf. The bookshelves are getting bigger. One thing they also do is get a little bit closer together as they get bigger and bigger, which I didn't draw very well. So they get a little closer and closer together as they get bigger and bigger. So let's start at the very beginning of the periodic table. We're going to start with hydrogen. It's got one proton. We know that from just looking at the periodic table, which means that for most neutral atoms, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. And so hydrogen has one electron. Remember, we use that E minus symbol. So it's got one electron. Where is that one electron going to go? Well, he comes in. He says, well, hmm, where should I go? And he thinks to himself, well, I could go way out here. I could go in here. I could go to any of the shelves because everything's empty. I could go anywhere I want to. Where is he going to want to be? Is he going to want to be far away from all these positive charges on the left? Or is he going to want to be close to all these positive charges on the left? Negative and positive attracted to one another. He is not going to want to go out to this one way out there. He's going to want to go down here. And so our first electron goes in our first bookshelf. And we have a name for that first bookshelf. We call it n equals 1. Right? It's the first bookshelf, n equals 1. So that first electron goes down in there. So hydrogen, its first electron goes in there. It doesn't want to be anywhere else because it's not as happy. It wants to be as close to those positive charges as possible. And so we say that the configuration of hydrogen is that there's one electron in the first level. Not very exciting. All righty. So let's move on to helium. Helium has how many electrons? Well, if we look at helium, it's right here on the periodic table. It's number two. It's got two protons, which means it also has two electrons. Where do you think that first electron is going to go? It's going to go in exactly the same spot it did with hydrogen, right? It's going to be as close as possible. Now that second electron comes in, where is it going to want to go? It's going to want to go far away or close. Well, same thing. It's attracted to those positive charges. So it's going to say, hey, I'm going to come down here and I want to be as close as possible to those positive charges and I'm going to rest on this first bookshelf. Okay, so two electrons there in that first bookshelf. And the configuration, this is what we call a simplified configuration, is just two two in the first bookshelf. Where it gets a little more confusing, perhaps, for some, is what happens when we go to lithium. Well, you'll notice, in order to get to lithium, what did we have to do? We had to go to a new row on the periodic table. And what does that mean? When we go to a new row on the periodic table, it means our last row is full. So if you look back at this table here, 
you'll notice that they have, you know, one for he hydrogen, two for helium, and then they go and they don't put any more in that first row. And you're like, well, how am I supposed to know that? And you're supposed to know that because the periodic table tells you. You got to the end of that first row, which means you're full now, and you can't fit any more in here. So this row is full when there's two electrons on it, but the periodic table tells you that. So because we went to the second row or period on the periodic table, we know that some of our electrons have to go into the second bookshelf. Our first two, right, they're gonna go as close as possible. Lithium has three electrons. The first two are gonna go as close as possible. They're gonna stay down here, and that N equals one. An additional electron's gonna come in. Is he gonna wanna go far away, or is he gonna wanna go close, right? He wants to go close, he wants to go down here, but it's full, right? So he settles for second best, which is this one here, and he hunkers down in that second row. And now what's our configuration? Lithium, well, there's two in that first row, these two here, and then there's one in that second bookshelf. Let me put a comma, and we say that the simplified configuration of lithium is two comma one, two in the first row, one in the second. <coughs> And these rows, like I said, we can call them n equals 1. We can also call them shells. So we say that this is the first shell. What do you think this one's called? n equals 2, and it's the second shell. But we're going to use this simplified just 2 comma 1 as we go forward. All righty. So what's next? Well, let's move on. Not every element on the periodic table. Let's move over to nitrogen here. Nitrogen has 7 electrons because it has 7 protons. Right? So where are those electrons going to go? Where do you think those first two are going to go? The first two are going to go in that first row. The next ones? Well, if we go across the periodic table, did we finish a row here? We didn't. And so that means they're all going to go into the same shell. They're going to go into n equals 2. How many of them? Well, there's seven total, two in the first row, which means there's got to be five in the second row. And you can always count that just by counting across the periodic table. One, two, three four and five to nitrogen. So I'm going to put five total electrons in my second shell, n equals two. And now I can see very visually that my configuration of nitrogen is that there's two in the first shell, n equals one, and there's five in the second shell, n equals two. Now what do you think happens when we get to neon? It's got 10 electrons. Two are going to go in that first one because they want to be as close as possible. And eight are going to go in the second one. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> I had to squeeze that last one in. So there's eight in the second row. So if we get to neon, that's going to be two comma eight. Now what do you think happens as we get to the end of that row? What does the periodic table tell us? Full! We're at the end of a row. Neon is full. That second shell, n equals two, is full. So any more electrons are going to have to go into n equals 3. So when we put sodium with 11 electrons, its first 10 are going to go as close as possible. But that 11th electron has to go up here. And so for sodium, we've got 2 in the first, 8 in the second, and 1 in the third. And we just keep doing that. We go to argon, what do you think happens? We get 2, comma, 8, comma, 8, right? If you count across argon, there's <coughs> 8 in that row. Then what happens? That row is full. And so let's go to potassium. What is potassium? Whoops, sorry, my picture was covering up. What does potassium look like? Well, potassium has 19 electrons. Where are they going to go? Well, two are going to go in the first row. Eight are going to go in the second row. Eight are going to go in the third row. We know that because that's what we just said for argon. So it's going to be two comma eight comma eight. Well, let's add that up. That's eight plus eight is 16. Two is 18. And we need 19 electrons, so that must mean there's one in the third row. So let's do that. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one. And that's what potassium looks like. <coughs> so we can do that up through calcium. And it turns out it gets a little more complicated after that. So we're not going to do these simplified configurations for up anything past calcium. But it's really easy. You follow the periodic table. When you get to the end of the row, that row is full and you have to go to the next one. You have to go from n equals one to n equals two to n equals three. Alrighty, so those are what we call simplified electron configurations. All right, so question for you, what's the electron configuration of sulfur? 
take a moment, look at your periodic table, pause the video, and see if you can come up with that one. Alrighty. So we look at our periodic table. Sulfur there is in the third row, the third period. It is number 16. And so what do we do? We know there's two in the first row. We count across lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Eight in the second row. And we count across sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, and sulfur. Six in the third row. So we have a configuration of two comma eight comma six. And hopefully that's what you answered for sulfur. All righty. So chemistry determined by the electrons. Why? Because as one atom comes up to the other atom, it's the first thing they see because the electrons are so far away from the nucleus. This atom's electrons interacts with this atom's electrons. Now, we now know that there's different shells, right? There's n equals 1, there's n equals 2, there's n equals 3. And so we've got one atom over here, whee! Oh, let me just do that. With electrons, and n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and let's say it's got one or two out here, and n equals three. And it comes up to another atom on the right, let's make this guy green, and he's only got less electrons, so he's only got two, three, four, five, six. So he's got a configuration of two comma six, two in the first row, six in the second. This one has a configuration of uh, two comma eight comma two. If you want to test yourself, you can look back at the periodic table and try to figure out what atoms these are. So how are they going to interact with each other? Are all those electrons on our black one going to interact with all those electrons on the green one? As they come close to each other, what we're going to do is we're going to highlight this guy and we're going to start moving him closer to the other one. Do 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 do. What happens? Who interacts first? Who interacts first? It's these outer electrons, right? These two here, and it got buried by the text there, but the six here. They're the ones that are going to touch each other first because they're furthest away from the nucleus. So not only are electrons the things that determine the chemistry, it's actually mostly just those outermost electrons that determine the chemistry because those are the ones that atoms see first. Right? So it's the ones furthest from the nucleus that do all of our chemistry work. And we call those valence electrons. So valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell. And we can get those from our configurations. If, for example, we talk about oxygen, it's got a configuration of 2 comma 6. The outermost shell has 6, and we say that oxygen has 6 valence electrons. If, on the other hand, we talk about potassium over here, we said that was 2 comma 8 comma 8 comma 1. The outermost one is the 1, and we say that potassium has 1 valence electron. So how many valence electrons would boron have? Well, its configuration is 2 comma 3, right? 2 in the first row, hydrogen, helium, 1, 2, 3 in the second row. And so it would have 3 valence electrons. And so it turns out we can write, figure out the number of valence electrons, the number of important electrons, ones that are going to be doing the chemistry, just by looking at these simplified electron configurations. Now, it gets a little trickier because we said our simplified configurations only go up to calcium. What happens if we want to know how many valence electrons are in bromine. What are we going to do then? Well, it turns out everybody in the same group, if you remember, the groups on the periodic table were sorted by chemistry. We now determined that valence electrons are what determines chemistry. So what can you guess about the number of valence electrons in a group? Is it's always going to be the same. So how many valence electrons in bromine? We don't know how to write its configuration, but we do know how to write the configuration of fluorine. So I'm going to erase my oxygen up here. We do know how to write the configuration of fluorine, which is 2 comma 7. Seven valence electrons in the outer one. So guess what bromine has? It has seven valence electrons, just like fluorine did. So everybody in the same group has the same number of valence electrons. So 
Over here on the left, we did potassium just a moment ago. One valence electron. Lithium, one valence electron. Sodium, one valence electron. Rubidium, one valence electron. Everybody in the same group. And that makes finding valence electrons really easy. What I personally do is I always pay attention simply to row number two on the periodic table. I always calculate my valence electrons by looking at row number two. So if I've got P here, phosphorus, I want to know how many valence electrons. Well, I'm always just going to look and see how many valence electrons does nitrogen have. I count across one, two, three, four, five. So if nitrogen has five valence electrons, which means phosphorus has five valence electrons. Some people will point out to you that you can also use these old group numbers for that. And that's true, but I'd rather have you do it by counting because you don't always have those old group numbers available to you on more modern periodic tables. All right, so you should be able to find out valence electrons of things just by looking at the periodic table and looking at what group it's in. All righty. How do we draw these valence electrons? We usually draw them as dots. So if you look back at calcium, calcium is in the alkaline earth metals. It has two valence electrons. And what we normally draw is just a pair of dots on one side of the calcium. I could just draw it on this side as well. We'll find out later there's reasons for drawing them more on one side or the other, but for now you can draw them any way you want. Silicon, four valence electrons. If you look back at the periodic table, so we can draw it like that. We could also draw it with those electrons spaced one on each side. And again, we'll see later on what reasons for doing it. I'll accept any way you draw it if for a, a quiz or test for now. And then <clears throat> what are some rules? In general, we don't draw more than two dots per side. Now, I'm going to violate my own rule later on in the semester, but for now, we don't draw more than two dots per side in general. And so if something had eight valence electrons, you wouldn't put four on one side and four on the other. You'd put two, 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 and two. So for example, if we had our noble gas neon, we'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, just like that. Alrighty, so now we know about valence electrons, those outermost electrons that are most responsible for the chemistry. We get that by looking at our electron configurations and just looking at that last shell. The outermost shell, how many electrons are there? Those are going to be the ones that do our work for us. Okay, thanks so much for being here.